So I'm going to give you guys, put it in the chat box, and then also I can do it um, in the... Uh, you don't see the chat box on Facebook. Yeah, so I'll put it, if you're, if you're on Facebook, I'll put it in the, there too. But this is the uh, going to be the um, replay of Alice Kuyper's wonderful webinar from last night, which was called Connecting with Your Creativity. And I went ahead and put the link in there so you guys can enjoy it and it's totally free. So there it is right there. So you can copy that, save it for your, save it for later. And right now let's get back to starting this thing. All right, we're ready. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, Welcome, special welcome to you. What this is, is a weekly series. We started last week uh, where we're gonna be here every Thursday night at this time. And we may also, one of the things I was thinking about, we could ask you guys about later is maybe doing some occasionally in the daytime, folks in Europe or people who are around during the day, but we'll see about that. But we're here every week to stay connected with you and to keep you motivated and moving forward and thinking positively through this time. And every week, you're going to have Laura and a guest talking about something really useful to you. Last week, we had Katie Davis, and we had a wonderful tribute to Tommy DePalwa. And tonight, we have Carrie Flanagan, who you're going to love, who will talk to us about the magazine market and why this is a particularly good time to be writing for magazines. So if you are brand new to us, and if you are not getting, if you, first of all, if you got an email from us today that said, we're having a social tonight, you're good, you're on the list, you're all set. But if let's say you're watching on um, Facebook or you're in, uh, somehow you got this link and you're here and you wanna find out about the socials, there are two ways of doing it. There's the straightforward way and there's the fun way. Okay, so this is the straightforward way. You can just go to writeforkids.org forward slash social and you'll get on our list and then you'll get the emails. So that's definitely one way to do it. The fun way to do it, because you get a gift, is to sign up at uh, and get our ultimate children's writing cheat sheet. We've taken 30 years of our children's writing knowledge and put it into a 23 page ebook. It's pretty amazing. I don't know if anybody, if anybody has this and they wanna put it in the chat box if they're enjoying it. Uh, it, is, it is really just a great re reference. It's completely free. And if you sign up for it, you will be on our list. Thank you, yeah, oh, there it is. I've seen a bunch of people. So um, if you sign up, if you go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash or hyphen cheat sheet. It is cool, you know, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate uh, hyphen cheat sheet. Lisa, email me and I will, I'll get you a copy. Uh, go there uh, and sign up and get the cheat sheet. You'll get it free and then you will be on our list. So you will find out about everything that we do, all of our uh, free webinars like we had last night with Alice Kuypers and everything else we have planned. So go there and do that. And uh, in fact, I'm going to put that in the, in the, uh, chat box right now. And somebody asked if the Tommy DePaola uh, event was recorded. It absolutely was. We record everything. And you can go to, and when you're at, yeah, when you're at um, writeforkids.org, that's our blog, and that's where we post all the replays. So all, everything will be there. So go ahead and go to, again, uh, writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate cheat sheet. And now it's in the chat box too. Okay. Oops. Nope, that's my thing to do. I can't, I'm infringing on Laura's territory. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm done. I've, I've done my part. I've got us on Facebook. <laughs> and I um, hope people are watching there. And right now what I'm gonna do is turn up the mic, uh, the camera just for a second, and the next face you see will be Laura's. You can just scoop. Oh, we're going informal tonight, okay. I'm always afraid if we turn off the camera and someone logs on to Facebook at that moment and sees just a blank screen that they're gonna, you know, leave. So <laughs> anyway, hi everybody. <laughs> Laura Back is here. Uh, welcome to all of our new people. Um, so I get to do the fun stuff. And one of the really fun things that we started doing last week is celebrating the uh, accomplishments of our subscribers. So today I am highlighting three wonderful writers and their amazing accomplishments. So Dawn Doig, and, and I hope you're, I'm saying your last name 
correctly, Dawn. Um, her picture book was published by Windex Canada as a humanitarian project to improve public awareness of childhood hearing loss. And Dawn wrote to us that she's a um, audiologist, I believe, um, and uh, she uh, was working with a team of Canadian healthcare professionals in Kuwait, and that's when she wrote this story. And she was also recently featured on Canadian Writers Abroad. So Dawn, good job. That's amazing. Um, then we have Deborah Bardish, Barch. I know I'm massacring your names and I'm so sorry. Her debut picture book with Clear Fork Publishing came out in March 2019. So belated congratulations to you, Deborah. I love the cover. I, I really do. That's That looks like a really charming book. So congratulations to you. And I have to move my head here so I can see. <laughs> Melissa Michael just self-published her debut picture book, The Doll, A Child's Survival of the Holocaust. And she wrote to me that her um, launch party in Toronto, I guess, has been postponed because of nobody being able to get out. So I hope you get to reschedule that soon, Melissa. So congratulations, everyone, for that. Those are terrific, terrific accomplishments and good news. And next week, I expect you all, I decided you all have to make your own homemade confetti. So when we have these celebrate announcements, we can all throw confetti in the air, uh, which means I'm going to have to do it too. So I just realized. <laughs> I just made myself a big mess I'm going to have to clean up next week. Maybe I'll have a little noisemaker or something instead. I'll have to see what we have in the closet from last New Year's Eve, whatever I can dig up. So if you have good news that you want to share, that you want us to announce on a, a distancing social, please email mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line. And it doesn't have to be a book publication. You could have gotten a literary agent. Maybe you got a great review of a book. Maybe you finished um, your, your manuscript and you're ready to send it to a publisher. Whatever it is, send us your good news and we would love to help you celebrate. So I hope to hear from all of you in the next coming weeks so I can feature you on a distancing social. So another thing that I like to do every week is give industry updates. And last week, if you were here, you know I talked about whether or not you should be submitting manuscripts right now to editors and agents. I'm going to talk about this every week because I'm sure it's the question that you all have on your mind and I will keep you as updated as possible. Um, these are our fluid and ever-changing situations. So all I can do is tell you what I know right now. And what I don't right now is the sort of overwhelming, you know, the, the wisdom in the industry, uh, the, the opinion the, of people that I've talked to is still, yes, you can go ahead and submit. Agents and editors are still working. They're working from home. Um, um, but they, if, if they were open to manuscripts a month ago and there's no new news on their websites that says differently, you can go ahead and still submit to them. Um, <clears throat> I would like to, to sort of reiterate some stuff I said last week, which I will probably also say every week because it's so important. This is not an excuse to submit your manuscript before it's ready, thinking, well, they have time to read the slush pile. So they're going to you know, also have time to help fix my all the problems in, on my manuscript that normally I would have fixed myself. No, you still have to pay as much attention to your craft as you ever did. You still have to revise your work as thoroughly as you ever did. Um, have it critiqued by other readers and critique group. You can do that, you know, Send your, send your manuscripts by email back and forth, do, do Zoom critique groups, however you want to do that. But that feedback is still just as important. You still want to properly research the editors and agents to whom you're going to be submitting and make sure that your work fits with what they do and what they're looking for and follow the submission guidelines. So all those things still um, are just as true as they were a month, two months ago. 
The one thing that I do ask you to be aware of is um, these these people are under the same stress as we are. So they are probably having trouble getting full day of work in every day, as am I, as am many of you. So be patient. It might take them longer to get back to you. Um, the editors especially have had to um, readjust their work methods to do everything virtually, which includes editorial meetings that they might be having with their staff, meetings with art directors, uh, illustrators, all of that has to take place online now. And some of that might actually take longer than it normally would because they have to readjust to that new work environment. So just be patient uh, as far as getting response times. Um, Ebook sales are up which makes sense. We're home, we want to read, and we can't always get our hands on a paper hard copy of a book easily. Uh, audiobook sales are down, which is kind of an interesting um, phenomenon that we didn't expect. And where I've, what I've read a few places is they've discovered that, at least in the when it comes to adult books or young adult books, um, most people listen to audiobooks when they're commuting when they're on the bus, when they're on the train, um, and people aren't commuting right now. So less audiobooks are being sold, which I thought was really interesting. Now, I, for one, am listening to more audiobooks than I used to because I listen to them when I walk my dog. And my poor dog is getting walked like three times a day now <laughs> because that's all we have to do. Um, so I'm listening to a lot more audiobooks myself, but um, I'm sure that, that will, they will bounce back when we all get back to normal. But I just thought that was interesting. So if you have audiobooks out there on the market, just know that this is, everyone is feeling this same trend. So there's been a lot of interesting um, information coming out um, in the last week or so in the industry, industry publications, people talking about kind of exactly what's going on with publishing right now. And I wanted to give you guys an overview of this so that you understand the industry. A lot of this is nothing you can control, but I think it's always good for you to kind of understand the industry that you want to become a part of and how it works. And I've, I've read about this in several sources, but Beth Meacham, who's executive editor at Tor Books, did a great post on her Facebook page. And there's her Facebook um, address there. Um, it's her personal Facebook page. It's not the Tor Books Facebook page, where she kind of summed this up in a really beautiful way. So if you want to go read that post, I recommend it. But I'm just going to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version here. So while we say that editors, agents are still working pretty much the way they were, the printing part of books is being curtailed right now because of the, the you know, lockdowns and the social distancing and essential businesses, non-essential businesses being closed. So the book industry still gets the vast majority of our paper from China. So we know why that's having trouble getting to us right now. Um, we also get some paper from Canada, not as much, um, but um, big tariffs were put on, uh, you know, imports from Canada uh, um, at the beginning of the year. And so that made a lot of people, publishers, et cetera, go to, um, to China instead and made the Canadian paper manufacturers not want to sell their paper here. So, so anyway, we have a paper shortage in this country right now. Add to that, the paper has to be warehoused in huge warehouses. Many of those warehouses are closed right now. The printing press, the, the places where they actually print the books have to get the paper from the warehouses. We have fewer delivery drivers on the road. The warehouses are being cl are closed. Printers are not considered an essential business, so they're closed. Um, add to that the fact that bookstores aren't ordering as many books right now because they're not selling as many books right now. So that supply chain has slowed way down. 
And that circles back around to publishers aren't going to print as many books until they start getting orders for the books. And that's not going to happen until all of this is over. So we don't know how this is all going to shake down a year from now. We don't know how this is going to ultimately impact the business long term. But, and this is just my take on it now. So don't, don't say this is industry, you know, gospel. This is my take. I think a few things you're going to see happen. First of all, we might see some pub dates get pushed back on books. So if there's a book that's scheduled to come out in September, that might get pushed back a few months because they aren't selling as many books now. It's a cash flow issue. Plus, there's books that are coming out right now that publishers aren't able to market as effectively because a lot, especially the big books by the big publishers, um, they rely a lot on author tours, book signings, a lot of in-person publicity marketing events to really promote these books, and that's not being done. So there are a few big titles that some publishers have postponed to the fall that were supposed to be published in April um, for that reason. That's got to create a domino effect down the road because publishers plan out their lists to you know, 18 months to two years in advance. They already know which books are coming out two years from now. And if you delay the publication now, they can't suddenly have twice as many books coming out a year from now. They're going to have to spread them out. I don't know how much this is going to happen, but I just wanted you to be aware of this because what may start to happen is, say you get a book contract in May. Yay! and we will celebrate it on a distancing social if we're still doing this. Um, normally, the contract might say the pub date of your book is 18 months from May or two years from May, which is a very standard time to wait for publication after you sign a book contract. Uh, picture books might take a little longer because they have to also contract with an illustrator and the illustrator has to fit you into the, into her schedule. So that might even be out a little longer. But let's just go for, for two years. If that publisher is getting backed up with releasing the titles that they already have under contract and have edited and designed and had illustrated and are ready to go, your pub date might get pushed back. So I just want you to be aware of this so that you're not shocked if it happens, so that you, you don't have an expectation of, I just signed a publishing contract, my book is going to be in the stores in six months. No, it's not. And it wouldn't normally, but now we're really going to have to be patient. Now, smaller publishers are not going to be as affected by juggling pub dates as much as bigger publishers, just because they have fewer titles to have to juggle. Um, and and some, a lot of small publishers work on a tighter turnaround time too. It just really depends on the publisher. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. And again, um, we will keep you updated as things change, as we learn more. And um, we're all just going to keep our fingers crossed. So let's move on to magazines. Um, Carrie, why don't you turn your uh, camera and microphone on and join me. Um, <clears throat> I am going to wait for Carrie to come on here. Oh, you know what? I might have to stop sharing my screen while you get on here, Carrie. Let can me you see. hear me? I can hear you. There can you me? are. Yay. There she is. So, hi, Carrie. So, I am really happy to welcome Carrie Flanagan as my uh, special guest um, today. Uh, Carrie's an author, writing consultant, presenter, and freelance writer with over 20 years experience in the publishing industry. Um, you can see her books right here. Um, she is the author of the Writer's Digest Guide to Magazine Article Writing, as you can see on the uh, upper right corner there of the, the slide, and the creator of our magazine Writing Blueprint from Writing Blueprints. That's us. Um, and she's published 12 other books, including three series with co-author Chuck Harrelson under the pen names C.K. Wiles and C.G. Harris. So you know if someone has pen names, they're really prolific because they have to <laughs> spread everything out. 
Um, and she presents at writing conferences. She organizes writing conferences. Carrie is really plugged into the whole publishing industry. But Carrie has written a lot of magazine articles. Uh, her articles and essays have appeared in publications and anthologies, including Writer's Digest, Alaska Magazine, The Writer, Family Fun, and Six Chicken Soup for the Soul books. So Carrie, I'm going to turn off my share here for a few minutes so we can um, see both of us. Okay. Just turn off. There oh. we go. All right. There so we go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here, Carrie. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how the magazine industry is doing right now. I talked about how some of the, the publishers are, are having issues with the supply chain and with obviously bookstores are closed, uh, right. which, which cuts down a lot on the ability to, to sell books. Um, is this affecting magazines as strongly from what you can tell? Not that I can see because if you're thinking about um, if you subscribe to a magazine and it gets sent to your house, you don't have to go anywhere to get it. Right. You can also go to the library and download magazines. So I know our local library, if you want to see the current issue of something, you go online and you can get that. So they're still being sold in different ways. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of people do subscribe. I mean, yes, you can go to Barnes and Noble and see their magazines, but that's only, it's just a handful of the number of magazines that are out there. So the last statistic I had found was there are still over 7,000 magazines in print. And a lot of those are trade magazines or association magazines, like if you're a member of something. So those are still going to be sent, which is right. great for us. Well, and when you think about you buy a magazine subscription, you pay for a year in advance. Mm -hmm. So these magazine publishers already have your money. And so they're obligated to fulfill that subscription. It's not like a book publisher where they don't get paid until you buy the book. Um, so economically, they're probably a little more stable right now. Um, and as far as, you know, the whole printing thing, magazines are weekly or monthly usually. So they've got to have their paper supply more on hand than book publishers do that have to get it from overseas. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I'm just, you know, making broad sort of generalizations here, but it seems that the whole process is probably a little bit different than, than with book publishing as far as producing those magazines. Um, so the other thing is, um, <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> the other thing is magazines have an editorial calendar they have to fill mm -hmm. every issue. So right. they require a lot of content. So if you are a writer and you are working on a young adult novel and you can't face it right now because it just requires too much of your thought process and creativity, mm -hmm. but the idea of maybe writing an 800 word article over about some topic that you are passionate about mm -hmm. might be appealing and might feel less daunting right now. And writing for magazines can still be just as creative and fulfilling as writing for books. So you've done both. So you can certainly attest to that. Absolutely. And when I first started writing for magazines, I was teaching full time. I had three kids at home, husband. So it fit into my life because I could wrap my head around an inch short. And right now, so many people are having a hard time of being creative for long periods of time. So this seems perfect um, because right now, what you would have to be doing is thinking about ideas and what you would want to query. So basically pitching the idea to an editor. So you're not even having to write it right now. What you're having to do is think about those topics that you wanna write about, even essays. So you were talking about Alice was saying, I um, think back to different things in your childhood well, those would make great personal essays. Those can be submitted to magazines um, because right now the magazines uh, are looking at September and October. So they're not publishing what's, you know, they don't need content that's going to come out right now. They need it for the fall, mm -hmm. which is good. And, and so to get our brain off of this virus and be thinking future and go, all right, what would I want to read in September? Exactly. So probably you don't want to be pitching articles 
now necessarily that are specific to living through this particular time we are in because Correct. they won't be published till the fall or later and hopefully we will be in a different place then. <laughs> exactly, and I'm not sure people will want to <laughs> go back and relive it that soon. However, if you came up with some amazing activities for your kids that you pull together from common household objects you happen to have and entertain them for hours, that might make a great article for a parenting magazine Absolutely. anytime. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Family fun takes a lot of craft ideas from freelancers. Um, yeah, and all the regional parenting magazines, you could send it to a whole bunch of them because they are not competing markets. So we have, a, you know, the Rocky Mountain parent that's here in Fort Collins, but then there's this Bay Area parent in San Francisco. Well, they're not going to be reading the same thing, so send it to both. And mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And these are things that you talk about in your magazine writing blueprint, mm -hmm. um, how to, which is, which is a great thing with magazines. You can come up with one idea and pitch it to several different markets mm -hmm. or even do a slightly different take on the same idea for several different markets, but you're doing one piece of research and then turning that into lots of different articles. Absolutely. So yeah. Take that idea and slant it to different things. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So what are some tips for starting to create some ideas for magazine articles that people can be doing at home right now? Did you happen to pull up the idea map? I do, and okay. I'm going to start sharing okay. my screen again so you can see it. Okay. So what I like to do is just start with making long lists of things and just let your brain go crazy and don't don't overthink it, um, but just start thinking of different ideas. So if we're looking at fall, it doesn't necessarily have to be seasonal, but we have one here, which is, wow, isn't that perfect timing? That <laughs> fall. Um, so if we're looking at apple picking, it's just this idea of apples, well, you can see that you can branch off into different topics. So in the left, the bottom left there, it's apple crafts. So what crafts can you make out of apples? And then you can branch off of those and think of different ideas. And what are oh, the business of running an apple orchard? Um, apple picking with small children. So you, you can just keep branching off of this and let your brain go crazy. And this could keep going. This is just you know a quick example we had, but this could keep going as well. Um, yes, and then and then this is from inside the magazine writing blueprint. This is one of the worksheets we have that you can fill out. Right an idea map and then the next one is you take one of these ideas that you really love you put it in the middle of a new idea map and you start branching out from that and cutting it down even farther so you get more specific you might come up with three or four great ideas off of that one idea mm -hmm. and um and these should all be things that you are excited about writing about am i correct <laughs> that's what i like i like i like to write about things i know but also things I want to know about. So I have done parenting articles, but I've also, one of my first ones was uh, Colorado wineries because I like wine and I wanted to learn about it. So why not pitch an idea and then get paid to go learn about wines? And I did. <laughs> that's, and that's a really good point. You don't have to be an expert at it right now. You just have to want to become an expert at it. And then you can do the research to get yourself there to the point where you can write a good article about it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I tend to do that. I just finished one for the writer magazine on the difference between screenplay writing and um, for movies and then writing plays because I was very curious. I have not done either, but I found experts that I could talk to that I could learn a lot about that. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely now, for interests. Now, if you find an idea that you're excited about and mm -hmm. you want to start researching that, mm -hmm but we're stuck at home. We can't travel to an apple orchard. Um, what are some of the ways to start doing good research from home? Obviously, Wikipedia is not one of them. Well, and actually, I use Wikipedia to give me ideas sometimes. I don't quote it, but it, it gives me a broad understanding of a topic. Then I can go off from there and research. Uh, go to your local library database. 
if you log in, they have some great um, research specific articles where, uh, yeah, it's just a great re uh, resource. But to pitch your article, you need to do enough research to write a query that makes it sound like you know what you're talking about, basically. So you don't have to do the full research quite yet, but just get an idea of the topic and enough interesting facts that you can put together your pitch and let the editor know the direction of your article. Mm -hmm. That answer. Right, and you want to have a really interesting focus of the idea. You don't want it to just be a very general article. I imagine the you have a much better chance of selling it if you have an interesting slant on it, um, or you know some some particular focus that hasn't been done before. Exactly. So even if we think of apple crafts. Um, that's still a broad topic, but how about apple crafts you can do with your toddler or apple crafts you can do with your tween. But those would be very different types of mm -hmm. articles. But if you can get definitely get an angle on it, it helps. Yes, yes. And also, you know, um, contacting experts on the topic mm -hmm. and asking them if you can interview them in the future, say you're, you're pitching an article idea, you just want to know if they would be open to doing an interview with you should you get the assignment mm -hmm. on this particular topic. And then you can put that in your query, right? That you've, you will be interviewing an expert on this topic. Right. And these experts are all sitting at home like we are. So <laughs> you can find their emails. Um, Carrie, what are some ways that you have found experts for your particular articles? Um, I Google, I mean, yes, do lots of Googling, find out whose name keeps popping up, um, and then look at their website, see what information they have on there and what their expertise and um, experience has been, and then just reach out. It, yes, email, I'm not afraid to reach out to anyone via email and see if they're open to answering questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if someone is a business owner, you can contact them through their business website. Absolutely. If you are writing about, say, a science, scientific subject, you can probably contact university professors um, and, and anybody who has studied that topic on right. a professional level through the university, et cetera. With a little digging, you can find emails of just about anybody these days. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then even if you don't know of a specific expert, there are times where I don't necessarily have a person in mind, but I will put in the query, I will be um, reaching out to child psychologists or you know, I will list the specific um, types of people I plan to interview, even if I don't specifically have a name. But if I'm doing a profile on someone, you definitely want to have their permission and they're okay first. Um, and yeah, the editor would want to know that. Great, great. So all of you, I expect you all to be uh, brainstorming some great ideas this week for possible magazine articles. Another thing you can do is make a list of everything you're good at and put some of those things in the middle of an idea map and brainstorm from there. Because you know a lot more than you realize already about certain things. Yes. And of course, you wouldn't want to just draw on your own expertise for an article. You want to also get other people's expertise in there as part of your research. But you might have a great starting point already just from what you're already good at or from something that you've been passionate about mm -hmm. and have already read extensively about might give you some great ideas for magazine articles. And this is for even uh, children's magazines, as well as magazines for adults. Children's magazines take articles as well. The topics are, and the approach to the topic is geared to whatever the age group of the magazine is. But mm -hmm. you can start even just familiarizing yourself online with, if you're a children's writer, with children's magazines. Uh, one great way to do that is to simply Google magazines for children and you will come up with a big list yes. and very often you could go to the magazine's website and read a few sample articles mm -hmm. right on the website right so that's a really great way to start doing some of that that research 
And a lot of the children's ones are on the library websites as well. Mm -hmm. I was pitching some poems to Baby Bug and mm -hmm. I was able to get online and look at um, at least six months, six months worth of worth of past issues. Wow, that was a hard sentence to say. But yeah, <laughs> I was able to get online and do that. So uh -huh. even if the library is closed, you still have access to looking at past issues of magazines. There you go. That's very valuable information right there. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to do. If you're going to pitch to a specific magazine, you want to read about six months worth of back issues, just mm -hmm. so you really understand what that magazine's all about. Absolutely. And you can sound more informed in your query letter. Yes. So awesome. Well, thank you, Carrie. This is some great information to get us thinking. And this is something you can do in little bits of time. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of you have kids home, you're homeschooling right now, you're trying to work, it's a chaotic time. You might only have 15 minutes at a time free, but you can start working on something like this in little pieces of time. Absolutely. So, okay, well, awesome. So I wanted to show you all, if, you're, if you are intrigued by this idea of writing for magazines, our magazine writing blueprint with Carrie as the instructor, um, we have a free trial edition on our writing blueprints website. And this bit.ly link right here will take you right to that. And so you can download that and you can, you, well, you don't download it, you, you, it's cloud-based. So you're actually doing it online but you'll get a, a really good chunk of the beginning of that uh, blueprint there and it will help you get started developing your ideas for mm -hmm. writing for magazines so you can check that out i also wanted to remind you all again uh, if you want to get the ultimate children's writing cheat sheet from us here's that uh, link writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet cheat sheet <laughs> and it has a lot of great information in it and then you will be on our list to get notified for all the stuff we're doing and finally if you don't want the cheat sheet but you still want to know about our distancing socials you can sign up for that at writeforkids.org forward slash social so i want to thank carrie for joining me tonight and thank, thank you all for being here with us again. And we hope to see you again next week. Um, we're gonna have some fun and I want you all to stay safe, stay well, and we will see you again next Thursday night. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.